So I thought I might talk about what is the stress response? Is it always bad? Is stress related to cancer? How can I best manage stress? And then talk about a specific program we have at the Tom Baker called Mindfulness-Based Cancer Recovery, where we train people in meditation and yoga. So that was my plan. Um, does anyone just like, oh, I really want to hear about X, Y, Z of those? Or shall I just sort of zoom through it? Zoom through it? OK. I will try. So everybody's familiar with that feeling when you're turning the corner in your car and you almost get sideswiped, right? <gasps> That's the stress response, right? Your heart starts beating, your palms are sweaty, your muscles tighten up, you can't breathe or you're breathing very shallow. And that's a very adaptive physiological process. We call it the fight or flight response. So what's happening is that your body perceives a threat in the environment and it's preparing to face that threat. Evolutionarily, the threat may have been something like a saber-toothed tiger coming across your path. It makes a lot of sense to have all the blood flowing to your muscles, your focus is very one-pointed. It shuts down all the housekeeping matters like your digestion and your glandular system and all that. You don't need that to fight the saber-toothed tiger, right? You need the adrenaline flowing in your blood. So those acute stressors were acute. They were short periods of time. So you would fight the saber-toothed tiger, you would run away as fast as you possibly could and all the blood in your muscles allowed you to do that or you would have the battle, and then afterward, there would be this decompensation, sort of. So there would be what we call the relaxation response, where your blood pressure goes down, your heart rate goes down, you return to homeostasis, right? And that's very adaptive in that context. But what about modern day? What are the kind of stressors we face? Are they saber-toothed tigers? Well, maybe your boss might resemble one, but. Usually not, right? They're chronic, ongoing stressors like coping with cancer, like uh, an unhealthy relationship, like conflict in the workplace, worrying about finances. But we respond in the same way biologically. We have that same stress response. The problem is that there's no release. There's no running away from the saber-toothed tiger. You can't really punch your boss in the mouth, or you could, but maybe only once, right? And then you have the stress of not having a job. So what do we do to adapt? It's a difficult situation. So sometimes the stress response becomes chronic. It becomes prolonged. One stressor is followed by another, is followed by another, and we never come down. We never get back to that place of homeostasis and balance in the parasympathetic sort of um, relaxation response. So when that happens, and it can easily happen, and people probably know what that feels like, insomnia is one of the side effects, we can try and cope, perhaps, and adapt, but sometimes we don't know how to do that. So we do things like take medication, maybe we drink too much alcohol, we smoke cigarettes, maybe we reach for the pint of haagen in the freezer. So we may do maladaptive things, right? We may try and suppress it and pretend it's not there and just keep going. Maybe we become workaholics. So we can get on this maladaptive cycle in this stress response, and what can happen is that your body can only take so much, right? Physiologically, your systems begin to break down. You become out of balance. And that can lead to vulnerability for many different conditions. So people become more susceptible to major depression, to anxiety disorders, to physical disorders, to, uh, and it really just depends on your, your genetic or your environmental predispositions and vulnerabilities. So everybody has a different genetic code, everyone has different exposures in the environment. So some people may be predisposed to mental illness, other people may be disposed to heart conditions, other people may be disposed to cancer conditions. So I'm not saying that stress directly causes cancer, the evidence on that is very mixed. But it is one of, I talk about the kind of pie, right? Even the cancer biologists don't know what causes cancer. It's very complicated. But one piece of the pie is likely what's happening with the way you perceive your environment and how you perceive stress and how you respond to it and how you manage it. So this is one piece that, again, we don't know how much of a role that may have played in anyone's journey in developing cancer, but we do know in fact, the research does show that people who are depressed, specifically, chronically, over time, are at higher risk of developing cancer as well as heart disease. And we know that people who 
continue to be depressed once they're diagnosed with cancer and do not resolve that, also have um, higher rates of, like, lower survival rates. So they're likely to relapse and perhaps succumb to their disease more. Um, you know, and this is not to depress everybody, it's to say there are things you can actually do. There are things within your control that you can begin to do that's going to not only make your quality of life better, but maybe even improve your quantity of life. And again, that's controversial, that research, but there are indications that there may be something going on there. So that's my first two questions. Um, so the stress response, is it always bad? Well, no, it's adaptive, right? So I'm not saying to you, you should never have a stress response, you should never feel worked up. No, it's actually really useful in the situations where you need to respond to a stressor. But you need to uh, learn ways to modulate that stress response so that you can also bring up the relaxation response, kind of the balance on the teeter-totter when it's necessary. And I often talk to patients about your set point. You know, so if your set point and your sort of stress level is way up here, like that's where you are all the time, it doesn't take a lot to set you off, right? So that you're having a panic attack or you're lashing out at someone or you're crying. But if you can lower your set point so that you're down here most of the time, well, imagine how much more resilient you are to those life events that, that come and throw you for a loop. You can handle a lot more. So how can I best manage stress? Well, let me talk to you. There's a number of different programs that are evidence-based. So there's one at the University of Miami called Cognitive Behavioral Stress Management. Um, it's a really good program, and there's, it's uh, actually initiated by a guy called Mike Antoni, and he's written a book that you can get called Cognitive Behavioral Stress Management in the Manual. It's very useful, and it has a whole bunch of different pieces of stress management. And one that's common across pretty much all stress management paradigms is learning how to control your physiology, your basic arousal level. Um, so that's sort of that stress response I'm talking about where your sympathetic, it's called nervous system, when it's aroused, you get that stress response. And then the parasympathetic is the other arm. And when you can activate that, you have the relaxation response. So that's when you feel calm and your heart rate goes down. And one way to bring that about is to do relaxation exercises. The simplest thing to do is deep breathing. Um, and I can teach you how to do that right now. Maybe I will. Um, so let's, let's try some, well, let's first of all just look at how we're breathing. <coughs> Actually, wait, maybe I should introduce mindfulness first. Let's do that. Um, so another approach to stress reduction is through mindfulness-based interventions. And how many people have heard of the idea of mindfulness? A very mindful crowd. OK, so most of you are familiar with this concept. It's the idea of being aware and awake in the present moment of everything that's going on in and around you with an attitude that's very accepting and open and non-judgmental. So it's a pretty simple concept, just being aware in the moment, but it's not easy. It's by no means easy. If you pay attention to where your mind often is, and many of you have probably tried this, you can try it even right now, kind of where is my mind? We'll do it in a moment. But you may find, and research shows, that about half the time, people's minds are not in the present moment. Where are they? Well, often our minds are in the past. So maybe we're reliving that encounter that happened and saying, oh, I should have said this, or I should have said that, or we're looking at the situation we're in, and we're like, how did this happen to me? You know, if only I'd done this, or if only I'd done that, I should have left that relationship, I should have exercised more, eat more healthy, and I wouldn't be here, right? So we have regrets, so we feel depressed, we get angry because you can't change the past. So dwelling there really only has pretty negative consequences. Or, and many of us are like this, your mind is racing off into the future. You're thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to handle all this? I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to get it all done. What if this? I don't know what's going to happen with my treatment and my outcome. And oh my gosh, how am I going to handle all these possibilities? They're fantasies, they're the future. None of this has happened, but we're living as if it is happening. So you're missing the moment. You're in the past, you're in the future, you're analyzing, you're planning. You miss the moments when you live your life, which are right now. Every breath you take in the present moment, that's all you get. That's your actual life. And it turns out, in those studies where they look at where people's minds are, they also ask them how they're feeling. And when people are in the present moment, they feel better. They're happier. So it's simple but it's not always easy. And the other 
effect of being in the moment, usually things are pretty much okay in the moment. We can handle them, right? It's all this worrying and projecting into the future that causes us trouble. There's this Mark Twain quote, my life has been nothing but a series of tragedies. Most of them never happened. You know, so it's almost, as I said, it's like you're living these things before they've even happened and most of them never will. Um, so if we can be in the moment, it tends to be a little more of a calming place. So maybe we'll bring these ideas together just by paying attention for a moment to our breathing. Can we do that? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Um, so I'm not going to ask you to change your breath at all. I want you to just pay attention and practice just being mindful of something very, very simple. And we choose the breath because the breath is there. The breath is with us every moment of every day. We don't often think about it. We don't have to think about it, thank goodness. Right? If you had to remind yourself, oh, breathe, oh, breathe again, breathe again, yeah, breathe, that'd be a problem, right? So the, bre the breath happens unconsciously, but we can also pay attention to it. And when we want to, we can exert conscious control over it. And that actually affects our physiology. So let's just pay attention to it now. And an easy way to pay attention to it is why don't you take one hand and put it over your belly and sit in a way that you can breathe freely. And if you're not sitting in a way that you can breathe freely, maybe ask yourself, well, why don't I sit in a way that I can breathe freely? <laughs> and one hand over your belly, like notice any judgmental thoughts about the size of your belly and you can let that go. <laughs> one hand over your chest. And if you're comfortable, just let your eyes close. And now you're breathing, I'm sure you are. So let's pay attention. And don't try and change it, just notice it. So you'll feel an in-breath, and you'll notice some movement. So where is that movement? Where in the body, which of your hands is rising? How much in each hand as you breathe in, and as you breathe out, what happens? So there's probably some movement there, too. And where is it? Across the chest, the belly, the sides, the back. And how is your breath flowing? Are the breaths relatively short, like one or two seconds? Are they longer? Is there a pause, perhaps, between the in and out breath? Or do they flow smoothly? And are you thinking to yourself, oh, I'm not breathing in the right way. I'll just let that go. So notice if the length of the in-breath is the same as the out-breath, if they're different, if there are pauses, if it's the same after the in-breath as it is after the out-breath. And is your mind wandering yet? Perhaps it has, perhaps it hasn't, and that's okay. That's what minds do. Gently lead it back if it's wandered elsewhere to the past or the future. Come back into the body and what else as a breath detective can you notice? Is there tension in the muscles, in your shoulders, in your neck, in your face? And as you continue breathing, you may or may not notice that your breath changes. So pay attention to that as well. So just a couple more breaths like this, paying attention, rising and falling. And then let your arms drop and open your eyes, return to the room. So maybe just a, a few bits of feedback. What, what was that like? What did you notice? Relaxing. Someone said relaxing? <coughs> what was relaxing about it? Who said that? No? Okay. Yeah, what was relaxing about it? Um, not having to pay attention to anything but just breathing. <laughs> so just letting go of all the worries, right? Yeah. Any other observations? Nice. nice. So, kind of felt pleasant, sort of so enjoyable. I'm yeah. Definitely more, feeling more grounded after that exercise. So you're more in your body. Totally. Yeah. We spend a lot of time in our heads, right? 
there's a, another quote, I think it's, uh, is that James Joyce, that one? Uh, Mr. Quinn lived a short distance from his body. <laughs> and a lot of times we do that. We're in our heads as if they're floating around in space or something, but we live in this body and every thought, every state of mind is a state of body, we like to say. So using the body as a way to ground yourself in the present moment is very useful. So some, other people, some of you may have found that a uh, relaxing experience. Did anyone notice their breath changing just on its own? It did, yeah. Were you trying to do that? No, we just sort of came out. Yeah, interesting, hey? So when the breath slows down, that's sort of an entry point to your entire nervous system. So when the breath slows down, all your physiology slows down, and you come more to that lower resting state I was talking about, that relaxation response. It balances you out physiologically somewhat. So just paying attention to your breath is a very, very simple mindfulness exercise that can ground you in the present moment. And that's something you can do anywhere, anytime. So the mindfulness program that we do, so mindfulness is this idea of just learning to be awake and aware in the present moment. It's both a way of being in the world, so it does not take extra time to be mindful. You can be mindful at any point in your day, or you can be mindless. Um, so it's a way of being in the world. It's also a practice that we set aside time for, mindfulness meditation, where we say, I'm going to take this time to train my mind to practice being more mindful because it's not a natural state of mind for most of us. It actually takes rehearsal. It's like learning a new skill, like playing the piano or tennis, right? You don't learn to play the piano by reading books about playing piano or watching movies. You have to actually play the piano. So to become mindful, you have to practice mindfulness. So the meditation is the practice that we do, and it can be very simple breath awareness like what we just did. So in our program, it's over a series of eight or nine weeks, and each week we teach you different exercises that are different ways to be mindful. In the body, we use gentle yoga, we use different meditation exercises. You practice at home every day. Um, and after eight or nine weeks, we're hoping that people have developed a consistent practice and more mindfulness in their everyday life. Um, so in a nutshell, really, that's what the practice is, and it's one of the best forms of stress reduction. And we've done lots of research. We've written a book. Michael and I, mindfulness-based cancer recovery, and have published 150 papers um, in different scientific journals showing benefits specifically for people with cancer and their loved ones, their support people. You know, and just quickly, some of the benefits we've looked at are decreases in stress symptoms, decreases in arousal, um, less anxiety, less depression, less stress symptoms or fewer stress symptoms. Less fatigue, I'm getting to that. <laughs> Less fatigue, better sleep. People also report positive psychological outcomes like feeling more grounded, feeling more at peace, a sense of meaning and purpose in life. And we have taken saliva samples and blood samples and we've looked at what's happening in the body. And we have shown that stress hormones change. The patterns of secretion of stress hormones become more normalized. We've looked at cells of the immune system and we see less inflammation, which typically is associated with poorer health outcomes. We have even looked at the DNA at telomere length, at the tips of the chromosomes that's associated with cell aging and risk for many disease factors, and we've shown a change over only eight weeks of practice. People's DNA is changing. So it's very suggestive. We don't know what any of this means, but we do know that it means that these practices are not in your head only. They're also in your body. So we hope that, I hope this is a taste of some of what's out there, and I'm happy to answer more questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Linda.